John chapter 3. I want to read this first to you. The title of my message is called Living the Good Life Now. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says it well. It says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship recreated in Jesus Christ, born anew, that we may do good works which he predestined, planned beforehand for us. How many of you are glad that he's predestined and planned some good things for us to do? Taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them. And this is my favorite part. Living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. I spent too many years living the bad life. I spent too many years living on cruise control and hoping that my life would get better if I could just marry the right person, have the kids, have the money, have the ministry. Then I would be ready to have the good life. And I came to a conclusion many years ago that ultimately whatever I needed wasn't going to give me the satisfaction of actually living the good life because living the good life was not a destination. It was a journey and it was about knowing a man, not necessarily knowing information. And so because of that, I found that living the good life, God predestined and ordained my life just like your life to live in him and to live out great things. How many of you know that God has a great plan for your life? He's excited about your life, whether you've blown it, done some stupid things, maybe have gone through some things that you don't want anyone else to know about, and you may feel totally discouraged and depressed and shattered even today. God is not, he's not given up on your life. He's not given up on, on who you are, what you're called to be, what he has ordained for you. He loves you. He's for you. He's got good things for you. He knows ultimately what's going to satisfy you. And he's prepared it all for you. And if you jump in full force in your relationship with him, I promise you, you will never be disappointed. The Bible says he's, that the righteous are never forsaken, that those that know him are never disappointed, and that we can be completely fulfilled and content if we walk with him. And so that doesn't mean everything goes easy, but it does mean that he knows what we need and that at the, end of the, at the end of our days, we can turn around and know that we did all that he asked us to do and we can, turn, we can have that fulfillment knowing that we've lived the life, the good life now that he's prepared for us. We're gonna talk about a story in the Bible in John chapter three, where there was the, one of the smartest men in all of the biblical times. He was part of a group of 71 men that memorized first five chapters of the Bible. This man was very intelligent. He was revered for his intelligence, for his morality. He was respected. And he was the kind of man that would walk into a room and everybody knew who he was. Everybody respected him and, and they looked to him to know which way should we go? What should we do? And what does the scriptures have to say about it? This man knew a lot. And at the end of the day, he was coming to Jesus late at night because he wanted to know how to live a good life. He wanted to know, how do I live this life? That, that You've been doing things that no one's ever seen. And you, you obviously have more. And I, I'm not experiencing this. And so he's coming to Jesus. And I want to say this. Living the good life is living in relationship, not just revelation. Living the good life is about being in relationship with the one who created you and knows you, not just knowing all about him. And this is the dilemma. This is Nicodemus. We're going to talk about him. This is his, his dilemma that he's coming to, is that he knows a lot of things, but he doesn't know the one who does all the things. John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who's a member of a Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Now, how, why would they know that? Well, for you, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So what Jesus is doing is he's getting their attention. He's saying, look, you're doing things that you have to be from God because people are being set free. Blind eyes are opening. Deaf ears are being opened. People are being fed. Something is up. Something is happening and you're from God. But what is going on? Because I know a lot, but I'm dead on the inside. But there is life that's come to our country. There's life that's come to our land. And I want to know about this. This is what's going on. Knowing God and knowing about him are, are two different realities. 
Knowing God and knowing about him are two different realities. How do I explain this? Well, let's see. I am a Judd's fan. How many of you would like to admit that you like country music and is not ashamed of it? Okay. You know, we're, we're a little bit in Hickville. I mean, you guys, I know there's a lot more of you than you would admit, but I like the Judd's and I grew up with the Judd's and I remember in high school, someone giving me a tape of theirs. And so something about an affection towards our high school music. How many of you still love your music that when you were in high school, they say that's the music that stays with you. You, right? Some of you, you turn it on and you just know it. It's your music. You know all the words. Well, that was me. And I, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not a huge country fan at this point, but the Judds have always stayed with me. And so my sister and I, uh, she bought me t- a ticket to go see them at Arco Arena this last fall. So I was so excited. So we left the kids and I think I was like seven months pregnant at the time. And we sat with thousands of other men and women and we sang all these Judd songs, you know, like grandpa, tell me about the good old days and like we're singing these and there's, there's people crying around me. We're having this, this moment. I have, there's women in front of me. It's like the grandma, the mom, the daughter, you know, they all three have beers and they're singing songs, you know, we're, and we're having this experience together of the Judds and, you know, you know them. I mean, I remember she'd say, this is when my mom wrote this song and I would think, I remember when I bought that album. I remember what I was doing. How do you remember that with certain songs? You remember when you bought that album you remember what you were doing when you listened to those, that music. So I had this experience and I was in heaven. I was in like Judd heaven. And, uh, and at the time, you know, so if somebody was asking me, you know, do you know the Judds? I would say, well, yeah, you know, I know them. And, and well, could you call them? Well, no, I don't have their number. They, I don't like know them. And if you asked my Nona, hey, do you know who Havila is? She would say, is that that crazy woman who attacked my tour bus? And she, it might be, it might've been me. No, she would say, no, we don't know who she is. But see, the difference is knowing a lot about someone and knowing them are two different things. But knowing a lot about someone gives you the feeling that you really know them. It gives you a false intimacy. And this is a dilemma of the church. We know a lot about God. We know a lot of scripture. We know the prayers to pray. We know the right things to say. And it gives us a false sense of knowing about him or knowing him, but we don't know him. And this is Nicodemus' dilemma. He knows a lot about the scriptures and about the things of God, but he doesn't know him. And that's, this is what's happening. You see, the enemy doesn't worry about us knowing a lot about God. In fact, he doesn't mind us buying the music, going to the concerts, attending the retreats. He doesn't mind us even quoting scripture, but it's when we start to actually believe it and act on it is when he starts to get nervous. How many of you have ever gone on a journey where you begin to, you really want to know God in this one area. And then all of a sudden you start to find a lot of resistance right? Like, God, I'm really, really going to get peace. I'm not going to be angry anymore. And then every stinking person is cutting you off on the freeway all of a sudden, right? Or it's, God, I just want to love people. And then the most unlovable, ridiculous person comes into your life and all of a sudden you just can't stand them. And you're saying things that you didn't want to say or do, but all you're trying to work on something. Or God, I want to get up in the morning and your bed feels like it's never felt before. Your pillows are hugging you, you know, and you're hearing this, don't get up. I love you from your bed, you know, and you're thinking, I just want to get up and meet with God. I want to, I want to hear him, but there's something about, there's a resistance because the enemy doesn't read our minds. He doesn't know what we're going to be doing, but he's an opportunist and he knows what has taken us out in the past. And he's able to say those things and, ex- and we're able to, to listen to those things and it takes us out. So we have to understand that when we get serious about God and the things of God, It's all of a sudden, our theology and our reality collides. The theology is the study of God. Theo is the name for God, and it's the study of God, theology. Your theology, what you believe about God, and what you actually, what what you think you know about God, and what you believe about God are going to collide. You know, the Israelites, when they left Egypt, they were in the desert for a long time. And when they had to cross the Red Sea, they could not see their promised land. And many times God asks us to step out and we can never see our promised land. And he says, I want you to come to know me for who I am. I want you to trust me. 
And many times we think if we could just see our promised land, I mean, how many of you think the Israelites, if God, God put the whole promise in front of them and said, run to your promised land, right? They would leave the Egyptians and they would leave Egypt and they would run to their promised land. But many times we get stuck in the desert and God is challenging us to know who he really is when we can't see in front of us. You see, faith is about not being able to see everything, but being able to believe it. And we sometimes get caught and I've got to see it to believe it. And that is going to hinder your faith. Faith is being caught in the act of believing. And so my question is, has your theology and your reality collided? And have you, have you let your theology shape your reality or have you let your reality shape your theology? God is looking for a people where we say, my theology is that God can. And so that is shaping my reality. My theology is that God will, and so that is shaping my reality. And we get caught up so much of experiencing what we think God wants to do when we see it. But God is saying, I want to raise you. It's time for you to grow up, sweetheart. It's time for you to begin to see what I see and begin to respond the way that I would respond. And this is what's going on with Nicodemus. You see, the Bible says in in, uh, John chapter 8, it says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of you have heard that? Even, Even presidents have said that. But that word no is not about knowledge. It's not about information. That same word is the same word used in the Bible when it says, and they will know their God and do great exploits. It's the same word that's used that says, and Adam knew Eve. Now we all know what new Eve in the Bible means, right? It's an intimate, that's an intimate word. When Adam knew Eve, it wasn't like he met her right? It's an intimate word. And so what it's talking about is, and they will know, they will intimately know the truth. The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the, and the life. I am truth. Everything I am is truth. So it's saying, I, uh, and they will know an intimate word that go back. If you can go back to the last scripture and they will know the truth. If you, and they will know Jesus, they will intimately know him and knowing him will set them free. Some of you have been bound and you don't know why. You've been discouraged. You don't know why. You've been, you've had chronic issues. It's because we have to know the truth, not just the information. How many of you have memorized and known and you're thinking, why am I not free? You need an encounter. Jesus wants to encounter your heart today. He wants to encounter your mind that you would not just know it, but that you would know it. You would experience it. He has set up divine encounters for you to know him all throughout your life. And he's, 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 he is pursuing you in a great way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the way. He's the way out. He's the way through it. He's the way to it. He always has been. He always will be. He is the way. Nothing you can do, nothing you need, nothing at this moment will get you through it if less, and only Jesus can. Jesus is our only hope. He's the only way that we ever will have hope in this life. He's the only savior. He's the only one that came and did what we could not do, set ourselves free. You know, I think about my boys and I've said it before. We have a candy section in our, in our house and when they go potty, they get a treat. How many of you wish your life was that simple? <laughs> and so they'll go in and I'll hear them trying to get to the candy and they're stacking chairs and, you know, they're, they're building scaffoldings, you know, and they're, they're like, they're, they're going crazy. They're baskets. And I hear Judah's coaching Hudson. You can do it. You can do it. You know, and Hudson's falling because he's the climber. He's the monkey. And, you know, he's getting up there. And, and sometimes with all the effort of them trying to get their candy, I, I just, my heart gets filled with cuteness. Do you know what I mean? Like that's a really deep place, right? To be filled with cuteness. You parents and grandparents know your heart gets filled with cuteness. It's profound. You'll have to study that. And, uh, I'll reach up and I'll go behind them and I'll grab them and their little hands reach up and they'll grab the candy, right? And they'll jump down and they'll run off, right? And they have this thing and, and it's like my heart's filled and they, they feel like they did it. Like they got the candy and they're excited, but my joy was reaching up. And this is what Jesus did for us. Jesus came when eternal life was out of our reach, when your shame, your condemnation, the reality that you sinned and fallen short of his glory and could never spend eternity with him. He came in and he sacrificed his own son, Jesus Christ, to die a death, to take the sin of the world, the the shame of the world, and put it on himself and to acquit all of us from the guilt that we deserve, which was death, 
because we've sinned and fallen short. We deserve death. And he came and Jesus Christ lifted us up out of, the, out of hell's grip, really. And he lifted us up that we could attain eternal life. This is what Jesus did. And so this is what Jesus is trying to explain to us. Amen. I'm glad that a few of us are excited about that. He replies to Nicodemus, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. He's telling Nicodemus, look, you have to be born again to experience eternal life. So Nicodemus asks a question, I mean, how can someone be born again? How can, how can you be born again when you're old? Nicodemus asks, I mean, surely they can't enter a second time in your mother's womb and be born. I mean, don't you love this mental picture? I'm sure he's thinking, come on, Jesus, let's not go there. You know, he's going, I gotta go back in my mom's womb. I mean, I'm a, I'm a grown man. This, I don't understand what you're trying to say. I don't get it. And this is what I love is that Jesus or God is not afraid of our questions. Our questions lead us to truth. But sometimes we're afraid of his answers. And so when we get his answers, we just keep asking the same question. Are you sure this isn't the one for me? Are you sure I shouldn't marry them? Are you sure? You know, I'm not getting the answer I want, so I'll just call somebody who will tell me it is. But sometimes he's not afraid. We ask, that's what leads us to life. We're always asking. This is what Nicodemus is doing. He's asking questions. He's saying, I am not getting this. What are you talking about? You see, many times Jesus will offend. God will offend our minds to reveal our hearts. He'll offend our minds. What do you mean you can heal my body? The doctor said this. What do you mean you're going to pay the bills? I don't have a job. What do you mean I'm going to be okay? I don't feel all right. I've never been okay. No one's, I've never been lovable. No one's, what do you mean I'm lovable? And he's revealing our heart. He's going after. It'll never, we'll never get to God by our minds. It's got to be a heart encounter. And the most amazing part is that Jesus God the Father put it out of our reach. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. And that drives us crazy. We want to do something. We want to, we want to work hard. I mean, how many of us feel good? We're doing the right thing. We feel good. There's a, there's a payoff. Yeah, but ultimately, when it comes to us and our souls, we could never do enough to earn salvation. Jesus already did it for us. And so it's whether we accept what he's already done, but not, we don't get to be added to the equation. And so he offends our minds because we want to earn it because we want to feel better. And ultimately, we could never earn it. He reveals our hearts that we, we are offered a free gift. Secondly, living the good life is living a regenerated life. Sometimes we forget this, but ultimately, not just praying the prayer and having the right, ha saying that we're Christians and being baptized is enough. We begin a journey of regeneration. What regeneration is, and if you just look at a regular definition, regeneration is an ability to replace damaged or missing parts. Damaged or missing body parts. It's, it's a part of regeneration. A starfish, you cut off an ar a, a, a little limb or whatever they're called, and it's, it's, it comes back. And an elkhorn, they lose an antler every year. It regenerates, it comes back. You were born with missing and broken areas. Whether you like it or not, there are areas in you that, that you needed a savior. You needed someone to come and restore. Now I, I was born in a pretty fantastic family. My mom and dad love each other. They've always loved me. I've, I've been held from a little girl. I've been comforted. I've had, a, I've had a lot of help and I've been believed in and not everything was perfect by any means. But in this, in this world, I think I had a pretty good life. And what shocks me is that even though I've had an incredible life, I still have so much damage and areas of brokenness that I am overwhelmed at times with needing a savior. And then I think about some of you that really didn't get to start out well, and you had the people closest to you that hurt you and abused you and neglected you, and, and you did not have what you really needed. And I think about you and I think, wow, what a savior. I mean, you need him just as much. And there's such a sense of what God can do and the, the brokenness that we need him. And I, I, just, I just know, I just am confident that Jesus wants to regenerate us to such a way that we can look back and even the areas that were so broken and inconceivable, he can restore and give us rebirth. 
I believe that nothing is too far for him, that nothing that we've experienced or has been done to us cannot be rebirthed, regenerated, and can give us fresh hope and fresh life for those areas. And God came to do not just a partial work for those things that only we could, oh, we could imagine. He came to do the things that were unthinkable, the areas that could not, no longer be regenerated, he came to do. And so we did not just, we're not just being redone, we're being reborn. We're not just being, we're not just re, well, you get to, you get to have a second start and we'll kind of think about, no, no, you get to wipe the slate clean. Everything you've ever done, Jesus and his blood came and it says that he came to purify us and that purity is not just doing everything right or having everything right done to us, but purity means being free from guilt and shame. That means every one of us gets to live a life of purity. Every one of us gets to have a mind of purity. We get to be wiped clean from guilt and shame at the foot of the cross. All of us get that experience. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to give us a bridge to life, to give us a bridge to life. Take a look at this video and I think it explains it well. Who am I? What is the purpose of my life, my life on this planet? Many go through life unfulfilled, unfocused, searching. A blank canvas waiting for a picture of purpose to be painted on us. What does it all mean? It was once said that there was a God-shaped blank in all of us. We look for many things to fill this. Friends, fashion, false faith fornication, and the facade of drug-induced fantasies, but follow me. Follow me to the edge of an abyss where deep down inside we all know something's missing. See, from the moment God spoke time into existence and shaped us with his own hands in his own image, his plan was for man and him to be one. Creator and creation communing together in beautiful harmony. Sounds perfect, right? So what happened? Sin. We're, 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 we're sinners by nature. Sin opened this void. Sin drove us away from our friends. Sin separated us from him. And for many centuries since, we as human beings have attempted to bridge this ever-widening gap with philosophies and religion, wealth and so-called moral decisions. But the divisions became more instilled, uh, that God-shaped hole in our hearts still unfilled, and mankind seemed doomed. Until, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Ye shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Oh, but <laughs> this wasn't no ordinary baby. See, he grew into a boy, then a man, then a preacher, leading a multitude of people with radical and really off-the-wall teachings like, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, turn the other cheek. He's the greatest teacher that ever was. But this was no ordinary preacher. See, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So for our sins, we had to pay the price. <laughs> they put nails in his hands. Betrayed and denied. They hung him high and stretched him wide on a cross for you and I. And over 2,000 years ago, spike through his side, the Son of God, our lamb slain before the world began, died. One of the most agonizing physical deaths that a person can suffer. They buried him in the tomb of a friend, but for three days his mother cried. And for three days his disciples ran, but thanks be to the Most High, that's not how the story ends, because three glorious days later, Jesus rose from the dead again. Oh, but this just wasn't any ordinary sacrifice because he became the way, the truth, and the life. And we now have a way through the Father, through him. Uh, through the cross, uh, we're now able to get across that great divide caused by sin, uh, separating us uh, from him. And he's calling us, but we've got to come. Uh, see, the choice is still ours, but he has provided all the love. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And if we only believe that Jesus Christ paid this price, Jesus said ye shall know the truth. No more separation. No more fear of death. No more holes in our heart. But we can now have eternal life. <laughs> you see, God gave man a choice. You either accept it or reject it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, if we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts, we will be saved. It's that easy, but we have to confess it, that he is Lord and we have to believe it, that he is the one who he said he is and that we will be saved. Regeneration is done at the foot of the cross, not at the power of your will. It's not done by what you, what you will yourself into. It's done by him. We talked about that, Romans chapter 5. It's done as a gift of grace. It's also regeneration is done by the Holy Spirit, not by the power of self-awareness. Listen, you finding out more about yourself is not going to lead to salvation. You finding out more about what you need and what you want is not going to lead you. You, the little things you hope will change. If I could lose the 10 pounds, if I could have that car, if I could have that marriage, if I could all change, I'll be a better person. I'll be happy. No, no, no. Living the good life now is about coming to a realization that you need the power of the Holy Spirit, God, the Father, to operate in your life and to help lead you and guide you into everlasting things. You cannot will it, you cannot wish it, you cannot hope it. There is no power in you that can set your life up that you somehow will have a better life because there are things that are coming against your life that you have no control over. And we have a free will in this world and that free world leads people into things that, that lead to death and lead to sickness and lead to brokenness. And so we need the power of God to keep us, protect us, help us in this life. Titus 3, 5 says it so well. He saved, not, saved us not based on deeds. That means it's a gift. Nothing you could have done could lead to salvation, which we have done in righteousness, which means right standing with God, but according to his mercy, by the what? Washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. You need, I need to be renewed and refreshed and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. So he explains in Nicodemus, he goes on, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. How many of you love the wind, right? You sit there and you can feel the wind blow and you can't, you can't touch it. I don't have wind. Here's wind. Look at wind. No, no. It just comes and it goes as it pleases. He says, so it is with everyone born of the spirit. And here Nicodemus, again, he's saying, how can this be? I mean, he is having a hard time. Listen, the gospel, salvation, the story of salvation is a simple story. And we overcomplicate it. We, it's, we make it complex, but it's not. He's saying, how can this be? And Jesus asked him, I mean, you're a teacher in Israel. How can you not understand these things? How can you not get it? You see, what he's trying to say to Nicodemus is this, the third thing. Living the good life is about living in a new nature. It's about living with a new nature, taking on a new nature. The first thing is that we are partakers of a divine nature. We're partakers of a divine nature. Let me ask you a question. Does your old identity still define you? Was what you once were still, what does your family still define you? Does what happened to you still define you? Does how people think about you and how they treat you still define you or does Jesus define you? Does how he feel about you, how he feels about you define you? You know, we can be transformed. Have you been transformed in the deepest part of you? Have you felt transformation? Have you sensed that you are, have a different empowerment than you have before knowing Christ? Second Peter 1 says, And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that will enable you to what? Share in his divine nature and escape from the world's corruption caused by human desires. Secondly, we've been given a new, we're a new creation. That means that we were born, yes, of a mom and we were born into a broken, damaged creation. But when we receive Jesus as Lord of our life and believe in him, we become a new creation. We are not defined by what's happened to us. We're not defined by the family. We are now part of the kingdom of God. We're now citizens of heaven. We're now foreigners in a strange land, the Bible says. And we now are partaking of his divine nature, but we are a new creation. That means that the way that you used to do, the things you used to do can now be changed. 
The thoughts you used to have, the way that you used to process life can now be changed. Do you have new thoughts? Do you do life differently? Do you do things differently? Are you processing the way that you process your life, the hope that you have, the joy that you have? Is it new? Is it found in the cross of Jesus Christ? Or is it found in what you used to think and how you used to do? How many of you look different since you've come to Christ? How many of you would say that people would not recognize you? Your high school friends would not recognize you. Your coworkers would not recognize you. It's because you have a new nature. You're being changed. How many of you look different? How many of you act different? How many of your, your language changed? Let's hope so. How many of you dress different? Your, your dress has even changed. The way that you, you approach people has changed. And it's not like you got the handbook. I mean, we, yeah, with the Bible, you say, yeah, but, but I mean, no one said, okay, so now that you're saved, let's walk you through this. You can't wear that. You can't do that. I mean, that pretty soon you're going to rebel against that. There's no lasting change in someone telling you what to do. But the lasting change comes when, when it's engaged in our hearts, the Holy Spirit changes us. And so what happens is, is that all of a sudden we're beginning to be regenerated and we're beginning to take on a new nature. And the Holy Spirit's our greatest coach. And he's saying, you can do this. And he's the, he's the God, the Father living in us saying, you can do this and you shouldn't do How many of you felt conviction all of a sudden? What you used to do all of a sudden, you felt this sense of, oh, that doesn't feel right. I shouldn't be doing that. Why is that? No one told you. The conviction of the Holy Spirit leads us to life. Listen, there are things in my life that I have to obey the Holy Spirit. There are things that I do because the Holy Spirit said, Havla, you can't handle it if you do anything else other than that. There are people I have to hang out with. There are things I need to do in my life that keep me safe. We're going to talk about that. We're a new creation. Do you desire holiness more than sin? Are you always trying to get away with something? Or do you just want to get close to God? Listen, the Bible says in Romans that when we think about the things of God and we're around the things of God, we please God. And I don't know about you, but the flesh in me likes to lead me straight to death, but it also is very easy for me to hang out with. And I need God. I need to be around him. I want to be around him. I want life to live and rule and reign in me. Second Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. A new creation has come. The old has gone. How many are grateful for that? And the new is here. We're a new man. Are you living a different lifestyle than, no, than before knowing Christ? Does your lifestyle look different? Oh, Havala, let's not. No. Do you look, or do you act different? There's, has you, have you set your life up differently? There are things that I don't do because quite frankly, I can't handle it. There's different things in my life that I have safeguards that protect me. You know, I'm one that I, I don't need to be up at a certain time of night. It's not good for me. I just don't do well. How many of you just know there are times within your day that you're more vulnerable than other times? I've given myself a bedtime. Why? Because I don't need to turn the TV on. I don't need to turn the computer on. I don't need to be around it. I have to protect myself. Don't look at me like I'm some heathen. Come on now. You guys know what I'm talking about. You don't need to go into that liquor store. You don't need to go into that, 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 that store where that, that girl who's not your wife looks at you. You don't need to go into this area or that area because that guy gives you, flatters you. There's certain places I don't go, I don't do, I, because I, I can't handle it. Because I want, I'm protecting myself. We are at the church, we're not good at this. We're just not. We're not good at protecting ourselves. We look at it like we somehow lack integrity when it's really that we lack wisdom. We, we, we judge ourselves. Well, if I'm a better Christian, I should be able to handle this. I should be able to watch this. Able to... No, no, no. It's because we know our own frailty. It's, it's, it's wisdom to protect yourself. We have, we have codes on our computer, every computer in our home. Every phone has a code. Every, every, our TV has a code. You can't watch anything. Uh, uh, other, uh, certain, there's a certain rating we can't watch. There's a code. There's, and we just, why? Because we're perverts. No, because. <laughs> because I want to protect myself. I want to guard myself. And there are certain times in my day and certain times in my, in certain seasons when I'm less safe than I am in other seasons. 
How many of you have felt that? Even in your marriage, there are certain times when I just don't need to be talking to, hanging out, walking. I, I don't need to be around that. Not because I don't have a great marriage and a great man and I'm not fully fulfilled. It's because the enemy knows I'm weak. And he's an opportunist and he would love nothing more than to add something else that I can be shamed about. And some things in my family I don't do because I'm trying to lead my kids into life. And there are certain things. We turned off cable recently. And, you know, I hate that. I love TV. I'm a love TV. I'm a TV watcher. I like it. I enjoy it. My mind goes a million miles an hour. And I just enjoy watching a show. Okay? I'm sorry. And we turned it off because I couldn't control the commercials that were going on in the home. And so what happened is, is my boys would come in and I wasn't watching a bad show, but when the, TV, the commercial would come on, I had, couldn't get to it fast enough and I was afraid that they were gonna see things that they didn't need their innocence robbed from them at this season. They needed, I couldn't walk them through it. They're too little. And so I couldn't say, hey, you know what? You just saw someone shot. I'm so sorry. That's not real. That's fake blood. It's gonna, I'll, you'll figure it out. You're three. But I had to say, no, I'm protecting my home. And so I have my little Netflix and Hulu and I watch what I want when I want to watch it. But I had to say, no, I'm protecting. I have a different lifestyle because I'm protecting and I want to run after God. And I think some of us, we're not good at, the church is not good at teaching us those things. And I'm saying it because I need to hear that and you need to hear it. And I'm a mom, so you just got mommed. Mom made, mom made, made us alive in Christ when we were dead in transgressions. How many of you were dead in transgressions? Your sin was leading you straight to hell, straight to death. How many of you were so numb? You were so broken. You, you were trying to go everywhere to feel something, feel alive, feel loved. You were, you were doing things because you just wanted to feel in control of your life. And the reality is you have no control. You are going to die. What you, you have no control. You've got a few out, out years on this earth and that's it. And so when we were dead in transgression, it says, by its grace, we have been saved. We are alive together in Christ, the Bible says. Do you feel empowered to put sin to death in your life? Do you feel empowered when something comes to rob, steal, kill from you? The Bible says, do you feel empowered to say, I will not, I will not do that. I will not go there. I don't care what you think of me. Some of us are so bound by human opinion that we would rather sit through a movie than get up and say, I can't watch this. I'm sorry. I'm guarding myself. And that's not religion. I just don't go there. Don't put other people down. Just say, I'm sorry. I'm the pervert. I'm the weak one. I, it's not you. It's me. I can't do this. I, I just can't. There are certain things I can't do. And I've already talked about that, so I won't go back there. But at the end of the day, do you feel empowered to say no? Say no to the things that are going to lead you astray. That is what partaking in divine nature does. It empowers you to do the right thing. You don't have the power to do the right thing. There's things you're going to do. How many of you have done the wrong thing when you so hoped that you would not? Right? I mean, how many of you have ever tried to go on a diet, right? I will not eat. I will not. I need this donut, right? I'm eating this. What am I doing, right? I mean, we do things where we don't want to. Or we don't have the power. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do the right thing. It is his divine nature that leads us to life. It's his divine nature that says, don't do that. Do this. You need this. It protects us and keeps us. And it is his love that leads us. Lastly, the last thing I'm going to say, we are created in Christ Jesus, which means we're reborn and we're recreated. And I'm going to start with the last verse that we began with. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. You have been recreated. All has been gone. Everything you've done that's been wrong, everything you've done to hurt anyone, anything that's been unmeditated or not meditated and premeditated sin. The stuff you thought about, you know what I'm talking about. The stuff you thought about and you went and did anyway, even though you knew you shouldn't, but you did it anyway, God came to redeem that. He does not hold you account. He holds you accountable, but he will not, that, that can be removed from your record. And we've been created to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you feel empowered by the Holy Spirit to live this new life? Do you feel empowered to do the right thing? I just want everyone just to look at me in the eyes for a minute. We're almost done. Today, you can start over. Today, you can press delete. That's the wonderful thing about living for God is that 
he allows us to start over. That if we truly want to begin again, and we truly want to be set free, and we truly want to live for him, we can do it today. We can live for him today. And we can start again. And maybe you've not felt empowered. Maybe you've prayed the prayer. And you can have the worship team come forward. But maybe you've prayed the prayer before. And, you know, the thing in the Bible says is that if we clean out the house and we don't fill it with something, it comes back stronger. How many of you felt redeemed and set free from things? But because you didn't act on it and uh, actively work it out, you feel even more bound and more discouraged and more shamed because what you said you wouldn't do, you did, and then you, you're caught up in that. Today, God wants to give you a new empowerment to live for him full-hearted. Some of you have prayed the prayer, but you've never been baptized. You need to be baptized. Next week, we're baptizing people. You need to be baptized. You need everyone around you to see, I am, I am with Christ. I'm with him today. And then some of you, I just believe, like, you, you've never, ever, you've just never, ever been reborn. In fact, if you were to die today, you would not be confident that you'd make it to heaven. You wouldn't be confident that Jesus would say, yeah, there's, there's my son, there's my daughter, I know them. You wouldn't have a confidence. And today, God wants to give you that confidence that you can be born again, saved and set free. Would you stand with me? We're gonna close today. But would you close your eyes for a minute? And I just, I'm gonna ask that no one move around. I just, I want everyone just to be able to focus on this. This is really important. This is about eternal souls. So if we can just, just say for a moment where you are. Today, if you feel like the Lord, if your heart's beating, you know that God is calling you. You know that you've never, ever made a commitment to him before. And you want freedom. And you want, uh, you want to restart, start again. And you believe in Jesus, but you've never made him Lord of your life before. You've never called upon his name and been saved. And you want everything wiped clean and you want to believe that he can do that. Would you just lift up your hand? No one's looking around at this time. Just there's a, good. There's hands. There's hands all over the room. You're not alone. There's hands. You're saying, that's me. I need to do that. I need to do this. Excellent. Excellent. You can put your hand down. Some of you... Today, you said, I've started. I, I prayed the prayer. I've, 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 I've believed, but I've never acted. I've never been regenerated in my spirit. I've never experienced new life. And I, I, I just need to do that today. I want to I wanna sign up again. I want to I wanna do this again. I, I'm tired of being lukewarm. I'm tired of having no passion. I'm tired of, of just barely making it. I want to be revived again. And I want it to stick this time. I want to know that I know that I know. Would you lift your hand and just look at me with your, oh, that's it, hands all over this. You're saying, that's me. I want to know. I want it with confidence. I'm signing up again. And lastly, some of you, uh, you you've, you've taken on the, the name of Christ, but you've never, ever worked on this new nature. You've never lived with a new nature saying, I want to live for Christ. I want my lifestyle. I want my, my, my words and my actions to line up with what I believe. And I haven't been doing that. And it's time for me to make that change. I want that new nature to be revived in me. I want you just to lift your hand and look at me. Excellent hands all over the room. If you're on a prayer team this morning, would you please come forward? You, you've, you know you're a, you're a part of a prayer team. I want you just to stand up front and look at the room. If you're a pastor, deacon, elder, uh, a leader in this house, we need, there's, I know there's more of you in this room. Just come forward and just line up in the front. And we're going to have Jordan sing a song. And if that was you today and you would like prayer, whether it be for salvation for the first time, whether it be recommitment or whether it be just a reviving in your spirit, would you please let someone pray with you? Would you please, please, please let someone believe God? If you're come forward, is there other leaders in the room? We just need more leaders. If you've been here for 10 years or seven years and you're a leader in this room, would you come forward and just be here to pray with somebody? I know there's more leaders in the room. If you're in the lobby or ushers, would you come down as well? Would you be willing to pray with somebody? Let's just, let's just get ready and let's begin to pray. So as he sings, would you come down and uh, let us pray with you and then we'll close. Thank you, Jesus.